All right, so uh, welcome everyone to today's public lecture with the Mathematical Sciences Institute. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I would like to pay my respect to elders past and present. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, Kate Turner. She, uh, she grew up in, uh, in Sydney, but I met her while she was uh, doing her PhD at the University of Chicago in uh, TA for you. Uh, a lot of data analysis. Then she did a, a postdoc at the PFL in, uh, in Switzerland, which was joined with the uh, uh, mathematical statistics group and laboratory for topology and neuroscience. And then she came here in 2017 or so. And uh, she is going to talk about the quantifying differences in shape via algebraic topology. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So the fundamental sort of motivating question um, is saying, suppose I have two sort of blobs in space, and I want to say they are this different, and put a number, okay? How do I put a number on how different two shapes are, okay? So you can think of these as being a subset of the plane or subset of 3D space. Um, I guess you could think of them as subsets of some higher dimensional space, but that's useful in less useful in terms of actual data analysis because, you know, geometric objects generally live in R2 or R3. Okay, so I have these two blobs and I want to say how different they are with a number. Okay, so one way to do this is to say, all right, I've got my collection of blobs, my shapes, and instead of thinking of them as shapes, I'm going to think about what happens if I sort of move, take, take a function from these shapes into some other space, which is nice. So I'm going to take my shapes, put them into a space where I have a metric, where I have a notion of distance. And then I can just define my distance as being the distance between these two shapes is the distance between their images in the something nice. Okay. So that is sort of, a classic way to try and define a distance, you do some sort of measurements of it and you can compare those measurements, all right? So then the question is, what choices should we make for these measurements? And these measurements don't have to be numbers, they can be complicated objects. Uh, so there are two kind of classic other schools of doing this, different to what I'm talking about today, but I thought I would just briefly describe them. Uh, good to know the competition. Uh, so the first is landmarks. And this is very much, you know, you can imagine uh, Charles Darwin with his um, different, you know, um, uh, specimens, and then they can mark locations of biological interest on their specimens. And then they can say, all right, I had a fish, fish too hard. I now have 50. 16 points, 16 points I can do. And then you could just say, all right, I'm going to ignore everything else about the shape. And I'm just going to remember these 16 points and know that it's meant to be a circle plus some other important places on the fish. And I'll just compare those points and compare those points and make my distance via those points. So, I mean, this was a necessity at a time when you didn't have computers that could scan objects that you had, you know, it's very low tech. And you can do calculations by hand because, you know, you still only got 16 points. That's still in the realm of pre-calculator. Um, but it has a number of drawbacks. I mean, it requires deciding what your 16 points here are. It requires having some expert who can figure out where they should be. If you ask two different experts, you're probably going to get two different spots. Um, and it's very time consuming. Okay. And you lose a lot of information because I've now only got 16 points. Some really complicated shape is now 16 points. So another kind of school of thought is to think about distortions of maps. So here you can think about, I have a sphere and I can distort it in different ways. And usually they require them to be conformal map. But the main idea is that I have two different objects. I map them both to a sphere and then I compare how much area, surface area is distorted as I move from one to the other. 
Okay. And so then that is my measurement. So these are the two main other schools of how you compare shapes. And I think there's at least, you know, the first one, you lose a lot of information. The second one, it's a little unclear whether you're capturing what you want to capture. And also it's very computationally intensive, uh, finding the optimal way of moving one thing to another. So because I'm in algebraic topology, the question is, I've got this hammer, how do I use it? All right, that's that was sort of the idea. You know, if I use, can I use topological invariants? Can I use topological measurements in order to quantify these differences in shape? Okay. So before I can say yes, yes, you can, because otherwise this talk would be rather boring. Um, I'm going to have to take this opportunity to make you all learn a bit of topology. Um, so the building blocks in when you're looking at calculating topological measurements are K cells. So these are like little patches of K dimensional space. All right. And so because we're only thinking about low dimensional objects, we're just going to think about zero, one, and two cells for today. So a zero cell is a point. Okay. It's just a zero dimensional object. That's the simplest thing you can get. A one cell is like an open interval. It's like a curvy line, but without the endpoints. Okay. And a two cell is sort of like if I took a disc, but I didn't include the boundary. So it's open, okay, an open ball, all right? And more generally, you can think about a K cell as being homeomorphic to an open ball, okay? So when I say K cell is one of these things, these are examples of them. If I take anything that is homeomorphic to one of these, it's still a, the, the same K cell. So I could take some sort of warped looking uh, curve, whatever I like, as long as it doesn't self-intersect, it's still a one cell, okay? Now these cells also have these things called boundaries, okay? And this boundary is what you would expect it to be. If I have a line, the boundary are the two endpoints. That's the thing that bounds the line, okay? If I have this open disk, the boundary is that circle that's on the edge. So it's all the things that just touch whatever your set is, okay? That's the boundary, okay? So when we take a shape, we build it up with these different cells, okay? Like a, like a jigsaw puzzle, okay? But you could, in order to put a cell on, I need to be able to glue it to lower dimensional stuff, okay? So we think about the, the skeleton as being all the things up to that dimension. So the zero skeleton is going to be a set of points. The one skeleton is basically a graph, okay? And here you're allowed loops. So it's points and then edges between some of those points. And then the two skeleton means I can stick some faces on. Okay, so I can stick my faces on. I'm gluing that top hemisphere and bottom hemisphere to my equator. Okay, so you can see I've built my sphere. This is an empty sphere with zero, one, and two cells. Okay, and so uh, I can then say, all right, I, I want to do algebraic topology. Where does the algebra come in? Well, algebra basically means always put into linear algebra. Okay, so we need to create linear algebra out of these cells, okay, these collections of cells. So what we're going to do is I'm going to sort of formally create vector spaces where I'm looking at linear combinations of these cells. Uh, I do everything over Z2. Everything in my field of applied topology does everything of Z2, partially because computers like binary and partially because you can avoid orientation. And orientation is pain. One equals minus one saves you in many, many an equation. So a chain is just a linear combination. I can say I'm this point plus this point and I'm that line plus that line, always plus just one, am I in it or am I not? Okay, and then uh, CK is just denoting the vector space of chains. So when I look at the sphere example, I have a single zero cell. So I have a vector space generated by A, which is that zero cell. If I'm looking at C1, this is linear combinations of one cells. I again have a one dimensional vector space containing just am I, have I got B or not? And then cha two chains, the, the, the space of two chains is going to be a two dimensional space. I can decide, do I include the Northern Hemisphere? Do I not? Do I include the Southern Hemisphere? Do I not? Okay. So I have a two-dimensional space, a one-dimensional space, and a one-dimensional space.
Using that attaching map, I can define what the boundary of a set of a cell is. Okay, so remember, I had made a rule earlier that I'm not allowed to include something unless I'm gluing it to lower dimensions. So, so for every for every cell, I can say what are the k minus one cells that lie in my boundary. Okay, and when we when we extend this linearly, we're going to get a, the thing called the boundary map. So it's going to be a linear map from the vector space of k cells to the vector space of k minus one cells. And don't worry, there will be an example. Okay, uh, so before I do the example, I just want to define the three terms. Cycles, they're the things that when they when you take their boundary, it's empty. So you have an empty boundary. Okay. Uh, boundaries are things that are the boundary of something. Okay, and homology is equivalence classes of cycles mod boundaries. So I think of two cycles as being equivalent if there's some kind of surface between them or some path, if it were, depending upon the dimension K, uh, they differ by some sort of bound. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's do, let's do that sphere again. So my zero chains are just A or not A, and the boundary of A is empty. If I take the boundary of a point, there is, there is nothing, okay? So my cycle is, is the vector space generated by A, all right? Now my one chains are generated by B, okay? That's that thing that goes around the equator. And when I take the boundary of B, I get A, and I also get A. So I got A twice. But I'm in Z2, so A plus A is zero. So my boundary of B is zero. So this means that the space of boundaries, the zero dimensional boundaries is empty, okay? Or well, it's zero, I guess, it's a vector space. So this tells me that I have homology of one dimension, okay? And so we define the dimension of the homology as these betas, okay? We can do the same thing for looking at uh, H1, so the homology dimension one. We have one cycle, that B, because its boundary was zero, okay? And then we need to know what one boundaries there are, okay? So we look at the two cells and we see that there are two cells. The boundary of the Northern hemisphere is B and the boundary of the Southern hemisphere is B. So they're both B, but that certainly means that B is a boundary. So our space of boundaries is also a one dimensional space generated by B. When I take the quotient, I just get zero. So I have no one dimensional homology. Finally, for H2, if I look at the cycles, I can get that if I take the Northern hemisphere plus the Southern hemisphere, the boundaries cancel out. And so that the boundary of N plus H is zero. I have no three cells. So certainly nothing can be a boundary of something larger. So I have this two dimensional homology. Okay, so what this is, is saying is that what you get, um, actually, let's do one more example and I will try and say in kind of wavy hands what each of these things are. So here I've got a cylinder, okay? So I have two one cells, A and B. I have two, sorry, I have two zero cells, A and B. I have two one, three one cells, C, D and E. And I have one two cell D, F. F. And so what I've done here is I've drawn the cylinder, just, you know, visualize it as a cylinder. I know it's not the greatest drawing. And then what I've done here is I've drawn sort of the square as if I'd like cut it along D and unwrapped it. Okay, so this will hopefully help us understanding what the boundary is. So if we calculate the boundary of A and the boundary of B is always zero because they're points. Okay, so my cycles are generated by A and B. But I also know that there is a one, there is that A plus B is a boundary. Because if I look at that edge D, it's it, the boundary of D is A plus B. So this means that when I quotient them up, I actually get a vector space generated by, you could say generated by A if you wanted. Uh, it's a one dimensional vector space. When you do two dimensions, quotient one dimensions, you have one dimension by, okay? So I have a one dimensional zero homology when I look at the one-dimensional homology, my cycles are the top one and the bottom one, okay? So I have a two-dimensional space of cycles. 
Um, but if I look at C plus, um, look, so let's look at the boundary of F, the face. I need to know which things are boundaries. I look at F, I take its boundary, I get D plus C plus D plus E. I get to do D twice, okay? And uh, the Ds cancel out. So I'm left with C plus E. So my boundary is going to be C plus E. So that means that my two-dimensional space, quotient to one-dimensional space, I'm left with one dimension. Okay. And then finally, uh, the single two cell doesn't have boundary zero. So there are no two cycles, two, yeah, there are no two cycles. So my two-dimensional homology is boring and nothing's there. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing that the zero dimensional space is one. The zero dimensional homology is one. And this corresponds to there being one connected component. And this is the general rule. The zero dimensional homology corresponds to the different connected components in your space. The one dimensional homology here is one. The one dimensional homology here is zero. And the big difference is that if I take the cylinder and I take that thing that goes round, no matter how I walk that circle, I'm never going to be able to close it. Okay, it's always kind of obstructed by being around that cylinder. Okay, but if I take any circle on the sphere, I can kind of contract it up to the North Pole. And so no, no loop in this space is kind of fundamentally there. Okay, so that's the difference between them. You can think of one dimensional homology as calculating these loops. And the two dimensional homology is calculating voids. They're sort of things within your within a surface that are, are closed up. In higher dimensions, you can think of it a different way, but for subsets of R3, that's a way of thinking about them. Okay, so I've defined my homology. This is that comment about connected components. Um, but if you thought that that calculation of homology was awful, too much, please run away. There is a topological invariant you can do without having to worry about any of that linear algebra. And all you do is you count the number of cells in different dimensions. So it turns out that if I was to redraw things in many different ways with different kinds of, you know, splitting up into cells, this quantity is always the same. Okay, so if I always just do the number of vertices, minus the number of edges, plus the number of faces uh, for a two-dimensional thing, that will always be the same number no matter how I triangulate it, and that's the Euler characteristic, okay? So you may have seen Euler's formula. This is basically it. Uh, so if you want to ignore everything involving homology, um, to some extent you can do that. Just ignore the bits of my talk that involve homology and come back and go, oh, yeah, but I could have just used Euler characteristic. Why are you going to all the fancy stuff? Um, so if I have two different spaces, one included into another, I can talk about how the homology evolves between them. Okay, so I can think about when two connected components merge together or when a new one appears. I can think about when holes kind of get filled in. All the maths here. Let's just ignore the maths and do an example with sublevel sets. Let's just do this. All right, so... Here I have a shape that I'm evolving over time, right? So I've got this shape at the end and I'm just going to filter through it. I'm going to just sort of raise the waters up and I'm sort of seeing it as I'm filling water into my shape, okay? It's a surface, but you can imagine it's kind of got a very thin boundary and I'm filling up the water, all right? So I start off with only a tiny boring little blob. Its homology is I've got one in dimension zero, nothing in high dimension. Okay, I keep filling more, a new thing appears. Okay, so I have this new connected component there, and I keep going, and then they merge together. And so what happens on the homology level is that I started off with one zero-dimensional homology thing. It's, it's still on living. And then I got a new homology thing, but it kind of merged with the previous one. So I can think that there's some sort of homology class that's living, but only over that short period of time. Okay, I keep filling, I keep filling. And then at this point up here, I start, I've, I've produced a loop. Okay, I've created a loop around that kind of weird donut thing. And so a, a loop is born and it never gets filled in, so it gets to live forever. And then finally, once I've reached the top of my kind of weird wonky torus, I start getting H2 class, a two-dimensional class, because I filled in 
like I've got a void inside it, and it gets to live forever. <clears throat> okay. So I want to use this approach to study shape. Okay, I want to look at how the shape, like a shape inside space. If I just did what is the homology group, then this solid donut, solid, and this solid coffee cup with a handle would be the same. They've got the same homology. They've just got the same homology as like a ring you have on your finger. It's got a single loop that goes around, a single connected component, bit boring. That's all it is. I can't tell anything apart. If I take my circle and I wibble it as much as I like, it's all the same. So to quantify difference in shape, to, to measure geometry, I have to make this parametric. And so we want to use these filter filtrations of the shape to capture that geometry. OK, so if I was to go up, just sort of filter upwards like I did in that previous picture, I would get exactly the same thing for both these pictures because I filtering up, I have one connected component at the beginning. I keep going up, I keep going up, and at some point I get a loop and then I keep going up and nothing else changes. So I can't just say, all right, let's just go up. We've got it. But if I was to say do a different direction, I would distinguish them. So in this situation, if I go across, okay, I've got a much bigger loop on my donut than I do on my coffee cup. And so I would see difference in how the homology changes. I would also see difference in how those Euler characteristics change, okay? Because the period of time where the Euler characteristic was, um, yeah, so a little bit better. Um, okay, so persistent homology transform and the Euler characteristic transform are these tools from applied topology where you can do that measuring. You know, I said you want to take measurements of something and then compare them in that measurement space. So these are two different ways of measuring a shape. You stick in a shape A and then in every direction you filter through, all right? And as you filter through, you look at how the homology or the Euler characteristic is evolving. Okay, and then you record it, okay? And you record them in every direction. So for every direction, I get this complicated topological measurement, all right? And the key result is that this actually loses no information, all right? So if you give me two different shapes, okay? Two different, I mean, I'm assuming here that they're compact and not too crazy, okay? No cantle sets allowed. Um, so I've got two compact, reasonable spaces. If I do this scanning process in every direction and measure the topological changes in every direction, then I could, in theory, recreate the original shapes. And so it means that if I take the distances between these topological measurements, I'm going to get an actual metric. I'm not going to get something that's a pseudo metric. I'm not going to get two things that are actually different being distance zero from each other. I, I'm not going to have the same situation as I might have with the fish where I had two fish that were quite different, but because I picked those particular landmarks, they looked the same, okay? So there are some cool applications, mostly done by other people, where they've used these topological um, transforms to be able to describe shapes and then do whatever analysis they wanted to do. So uh, there was a group, Michigan State, that used this to study the shape of barley seeds so barley being the plant. Um, and so there are a lot of different variety of beans that um, come, grow in a whole lot of different environments around the world. Uh, and the shape of the bee, of the seed does vary. It's sort of, you know, on the global scale, they're just a blob, but on, on sort of the more local scale, there are important geometric differences in shape. And it turns out that they also, like you can distinguish which one they are. And they've been doing more recent work where they relate, if you breed two together, predicting what the new shape would be in the shapes of what they breed. Um, uh, there's a group um, mainly at Brown and Duke and Columbia, some mixture of places, um, where they were looking at brain tubers uh, so uh, this is a particularly nasty brain tumor, uh, but the shape of the brain tumor has a great impact. Well, the, the shape itself doesn't, but the shape indicates um, what your disease prognosis is going to be and thus 
how you should be treated because, you know, how long you're going to live really affects how much of very invasive um, radiotherapy and stuff you want to have. Um, so they looked at disease prognosis of brain tumours. Uh, you can stick it into machine learning networks, uh, machine learning, so to deep networks and stuff like that. So instead of sticking in like a binary image, you could give your, your machine learning algorithms a bit of a hint and say, well, I'm actually caring about shape. Maybe I'll give you this representation instead. And it gives better results than if you just blindly put in the image. Um, you can use it for identification of species of trees by looking at their leaves. So this is another one where you're putting it into a machine learning algorithm. But you know, if you want to identify exactly which cherry tree species you have, what cultivar you have, you could send it to a lab. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming, et cetera, et cetera. Or these guys have made a little thing on a website where you take a photo of a leaf and it says, it's probably this. So if you're a farmer, that's a much more practical thing to do. And identifying exactly which cultivar you have is a useful thing uh, in, in farming. Uh, another brain tumor one, I'll ignore that. Uh, so this is a group at Brown. We're looking at shapes of things like teeth and bones and stuff like that, and relating different areas of the shape to how much they distinguish different species so one thing you can do is you can say, well, when I take these topological transforms, I can actually infer information about them. If they're different in these directions at these kinds of heights, then that's telling me it's something around here in the shape that's important. So this is sort of going back to the original shapes and coloring them by what is statistically significant. So they can say, aha, it's this bit of the molar that really indicates that you're going to be a vegetarian um, you know, the or vegetarian versus carnivore or whatever. Uh, that same group has also looked at shapes of proteins. So identifying if you have two different proteins, where they really are different uh, in a kind of statistically significant manner, uh, which is useful for understanding how the dynamics of proteins in particular. So they're interested in how dynamics change in shape over time within some sort of... Um, liquid or whatever. Uh, so the last example, because I like it, because it has pretty pictures, is um, looking at fonts, um, but the method can work for other things. So these topological transforms in their original formulation work best when you have two things of the same homology. Notably, those things in the, the other schools of thought required the same homology. Um, we just prefer it. Um, and the reason why we prefer it is because if you have different underlying homology, then it kind of warps your analysis. It sort of overtakes the distances more than other features. But if you use extended persistence, which is a variation I'm not going to describe, um, it means that you can quantify those essential classes as well. So you can quantify the difference between these two Gs, even though they are fundamentally different shapes topolo topologically, okay? So here is a picture of a whole lot of different uppercase A's. And you can take these topological transforms and compare the distances between them. And you can see that it really does represent the differences in shape. Okay, so a couple of these particular samples I've, I've highlighted here, that that's the, the original sort of data set. They just like take fonts in Word and like print them out and then just study them. Like the, they're, you know, standard fonts. Okay, you can see that there is a distinct between serif and sans serif. That's what the tiny words up there mean. Um, and so here is another example involving G. One of the fonts we picked didn't have a lowercase G, which was a bit unfortunate. Um, we'd already done the A's, so we kept it. Um, um, but you can see that there are two different types of G. You, know, you don't think about it when you're reading something, but the, the handwritten G, which looks like, uh, well, Comic Sans is always a disaster. Um, <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you do a handwritten G, it looks more like this one over here. You know, you just have a single loop and then it comes down. But if you've got a typewritten G, at least traditionally, they have the second loop. So they're called double and sec single story. 
And so you can see this nice division into double and single story, but you can still compare the double and single story, uh, even though they are able to be classified. You can say this double story is closer to this one, and it's also closer to this single story than it is to this other double story one. Um, so these are a bunch of examples of how you can use topology to classify these different shapes and to measure the differences between these different shapes. Um, thank you. Questions? It seems as though you're basically dealing with structure with this. Mm -hmm. uh, does this approach to generalize to non-structural analysis of quote unquote shape, whatever that might mean? So I guess I'm not quite sure what non-structural analysis means. Well, you, you know what structural analysis is. So for example, can you use this for analyzing processes? So I guess uh, a, a weird, uh, an independent state might be looking at the shape of exhaust plumes or something like oh, that. Oh, I see. Um, so it's not quite, it's, it's that's sort of got structure, but it, it, it yeah. Structure. So there are other tools from within applied topology which would probably be more appropriate than this particular transform. But, but you could you things. could cover things. So there is quite a lot of work done in, say, material science, where they may know, say, like the atoms locations, and then they're looking at the holes within how these are arranged or porous structures in rocks and those sorts of things, which seems more like that. Um, I think there may even be some in terms of vorticity and fluid and stuff like that. So you may not filter it by height. You might filter it by some other way where that parameter that you're kind of filtering by has some sort of domain specific reason for being this. You could, you could use density. That would be a totally reasonable thing to do. In the atom ones, often they look at distance, a weighted distance, depending upon which atom it is. So you kind of grow the balls around each atom and fill up space. Okay. And then, yeah. Can you extend it to the idea of function, but not in the mathematical sense, in the sort of common dictionary sense of with some function occurs or some process occurs? Can you abstract it to the topology of the process? So it's sort of like an, a, quite an abstract thing, or do you need a physical measurement to be able to apply? It doesn't have to be a physical measurement, but you do need a function. So generally, you would need some sort of function that goes to the real numbers from whatever your process is. It doesn't have to relate to geometry, but you would want to have some sort of measurement that you're going to be filtering by. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to what level of details of, of shape you can compare. I spent a lot of time last year um, understanding the shape of bells mm -hmm. to understand how they resonate. So if you, well, let's simplify it down to a cylinder, a cylinder. So a cylinder will re resonate, a perfect cylinder will resonate in degenerate pairs. But if there is a slight imperfection, mm -hmm. then those pairs are no longer gem de uh, no longer degenerate. Um, and the papers that I was looking at from to use final element analysis to understand the um, variations in the shape of the bell. Um, and and they're also looking at variations in the material, so the, the imperfection in the bronze. Um, so I think that often the imperfections in a material would appear as like, you know, when I said there were like that bumpy, empty torus, and there was like one, and then there was another, and then it merged, yeah. that little bump kind of corresponds to a little bar along my real line, that, that little, little homology class that lived for a bit of time, not very long, it's just like a local imperfection. And so I think locally you would get imperfections correspond to these homology classes that exist for a short period of time. Right, so yeah, I'm just wondering whether that might be a more useful approach to, to understanding these things, but I guess you still need to have that, that detailed understanding of the shape that you get from finite analysis anyway. 
Well, so what you need is to have some sort of, like generally in all these applications, someone's done some sort of scan of your shape yeah. and then you have like a often a very fine scale um, triangulation that you work from. Mm -hmm. You would need to have some sort of input, whether it be a triangulation of your shape or some sort of voxel binary image um, saying, are you there or are you not? Um, so, I mean, you have to represent your shape somehow to start with. But once you've got that representation, you don't need to use any other methods. Oh. Hmm. Thank you. Something to explain. More questions? Uh, yes. Um, you're going back to your fonts. You mm -hmm. have those on a two dimensional ramp. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I admitted all details. Uh, so uh, this is MDS. So these, these coordinates are the MDS coordinates given. So we got like a big pairwise distance matrix using a distance between these topological transforms, which I have not defined in this talk. But they're distances that do exist. They have reasonable properties, they're stable, et cetera. Um, so you take that big pairwise distance matrix, compute multidimensional scaling in order to represent it as a 2D thing. So they, they, the coordinates don't have a particular meaning. You can interpret them in terms of the original shape, if you look at the shapes, you can go, oh, it seems like the first one that is kind of measuring this, this kind of measurement, like how wide it is or something like that. So in the in the A's, it's a bit easier. Um, Sometimes like the measurements going, uh, I remember looking at this, staring at this and convincing myself the coordinates would be interpreted. Often you can interpret the coordinates in terms of geometric features. It's not going to be exactly that, but there's often a relationship. But it does tell you that perhaps those are the features that are relevant to distinguishing your shape and representative shape. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's follow-up question. Yeah. Related. At the start, you talked about your, your 16 point vision mm -hmm. and that uh, being a pre computed thing, but so it's a very easy thing to do without computers. How much computer power in a hand weighted sense is involved in something like this? So it depends upon, well, so it depends a little bit on how you represent your shape. So, how is it inputted? If you're inputting it as a binary image, uh, in this case, then the computation power to compute this is, um, well, the number of directions is one of the variables. It's sort of constant for that. Um, and so you can decide how many directions you're going to, to do that. And then for any particular direction, um, it's about, what is it? I think it's squared in the sort of length of the boundary curves. So I don't really care if like a fat object and a thin object don't take different amounts of time. It's just sort of how wibbly wobbly the, the boundary is. Because that kind of determines how complicated the homology can be in any direction. So it's not it's not great. It's not linear, but it's not awful. Um yeah. So Oh, do I get to choose? All right, couple shirt. Um, do you only consider directions that are like orthogonal to each other? Uh, so uh, I think in this case we took the uh, what we took like sixty four directions. I think for this, it's slightly arbitrary. Uh, in the barley seed one, they did a little bit of analysis about you know if I took sixteen directions versus one hundred and twenty eight directions. How much difference do I get? Does it really matter how many? And for them, they found that you didn't need that many directions to capture most of the variation. Um, it's easier if you take things with, like if you take something to always take its pair, because you effectively count both, compute both directions at the same time. Um, but other than that, it's it's fair game. Yeah. Uh, Similar question. Because the, um, the, the problems are different depending on the direction you come from. There's a human at the side of the way up is, or is there a way to work? Ah, uh, okay. So in some problems, there is a, an up. 
So for example, in this, we wanted it to not be rotated or changed so that the color was different to not, for example. In the barley seed example, um, there is a clear axis to, from which to do things. Uh, so sometimes there are ways that there is an obvious choice. Um, you can also do the computation expensive thing of considering all the different orientations, which kind of sucks, but is a way of doing things and, you know, is comparable to every other shape comparison thing. Uh, the final thing is you can look at the distribution of these um, topological summaries, so kind of forget which direction it is and just think of them as a set. And it turns out that that also completely describes the shape. I know, I broke your mind. If I just know the distribution of my Euler curves or my persistence <coughs> modules in every direction, I could, in theory, in practice, no, but I could, in theory, recreate the shape. So that is another workaround to make it not aligned by just ignoring mm -hmm. direction and just think of it as a set. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering how well uh, the font is at predicting whether, given like a new font is. Uh, so we didn't actually do that. So this was our toy example to show that the code worked um, <laughs> rather than the, the paper was actually a very theoretical paper about computational efficiency. Uh, so we didn't really explore the fonts properly. Um, I would be reluctant to do that without someone who was an expert in graphic design because I don't like trying to work in application domains without an expert in that domain. If you know someone who does graphic design and would like to look at fonts, you know, I'm keen. Um, but yeah, so we didn't look at that. Oh, there's a question on this. I think it's probably similar to someone else's. Maybe that will be the last. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.